So good morning. Who here builds applications for a living? Who builds distributed applications for a living? Who would like to have the problem of scale? <laughs> so that's actually the biggest problem that we face at some point in the, in the app dev cycle, right? And uh, uh, we all want to be successful, but then sometimes success is the, actually the dragon that kills us. And scale becomes the enemy rather than the friend that we want to have. And in, in many ways, um, we have had over the, the last few years, um, since the birth of the internet and so on, um, various technologies, various tools, platforms, rules of thumb, ways of building applications to try and get us to build scalable applications and to defeat the scale monster. Um, so we're going to talk about Orleans, which is a platform that I think tackles the problem fairly squarely. And in some sense, um, uh, I think this is the way in which we should be doing uh, highly scalable applications in the future. So um, welcome to our talk. My name is John Azariah. I work for Microsoft as a uh, software engineer. And this is Sergey Baikov. He's, um, I'll let him introduce himself. I, I've actually been dev lead for Project Orlean since the beginning. <laughs> Um, so this is kind of a cheesy slide, and actually it's incorrect. So it, the slope should be the other way around. It's a, our PowerPoint skills are not great to express what we wanted to show. So it shows the general kind of scale uh, growth. But if you think about it, if you step back, it's not just scale in terms of a huge number of servers. The architectures uh, hit their limit with um, CPU sizes in terms of number of uh, uh, transistors we can put. Uh, and the scaling out, even on, on uh, the silicon, uh, the silicon level. So at some point, the, we, we promised uh, 100 core CPUs a few years ago. At some point, they will arrive. And interestingly enough, in it, it, that case, you, you cannot have co coherent memory even at the processor level. So you need to do some kind of message passing and scale out even at the lower level. So these patterns uh, in, in general concerns with scale, they apply, kind of, I believe, all the way from the silicon to the cloud, scale of the cloud. Uh, just a quick intro to Orleans uh, for somebody who is unaware. So Orleans is the virtual actor model where you program kind of like in distributed C-sharp paradigm. So you start by defining an interface which has asynchronous methods return task, a TPL task, uh, promises for future values. Like in this case, say hello method takes a string and returns a promise for a string that will be fulfilled at some point in the future. So you define these interfaces and that's one uh, hard requirement to have everything asynchronous. And then you can use it, uh, it's kind of code in this way. So first line, you, you get um, a reference to the grade, a logical reference. So saying factory class, give me a reference for a grade that implements this interface which was defined for uh, identity of the actor, we call them grains, the user ID. And that uh, proxy you get back, it implements already the interface, so you can make a call right away. So it's totally local operation, uh, doesn't require any round trips, lookups, so just construct identity essentially in the form of this proxy object underneath and then make a call and through the, the magic of uh, TPL uh, async await, you can await the call without blocking thread and then continue execution when response actually arrives. So that, that's the basic uh, co construct, the, the very basic level. And when you implement, you implement a class that extends the base class grain and implements uh, one, extends the base class grain and implements one or more grain interfaces, like in this case, uh, our user. Uh, what you get here is the single thread execution guarantee. So this method will never run uh, concurrently with any other methods or any other calls to the same method. So that's the guarantee of the framework and it allows me to have a private variable counter and do just increment on it without worrying about data races, concurrency, I don't need logs, semaphores. So this is what the, the program model is for developer. But under the covers, the, this actual grains, they, they go through this uh, life cycle. So logically, they always exist. Logically, you can make a call to any grain with any identity of any type in the system. You don't care, you don't check if they're in memory or in storage. But most of your grains actually in storage, they're not in memory because they haven't been used recently. And so as you make a call, as the method call arrives, it gets activated, puts in memory in one of the servers, uh, handles requests as they come in, and as it becomes cold, the request stops coming in, the runtime knows that it's not used anymore and can deactivate it. And the process makes calls to the grain uh, code, say, hey, I'm activating you, if you need to do initialization, do it now, or I'm about to deactivate you, do something before I remove you from memory. 
that, that, that's the basis on which we're gonna build the rest of, of the patterns, just kind of a primer to the general model. That's right. So in another thing that uh, Sergey, um, so we, we have basically the actor as the unit of computation. That's the traditional way of, of thinking of actors, right? But one of the extensions that's uh, present in, in this whole activation, deactivation cycle is the ability for a grain to actually store a little bit of state. So not only is it the unit of computation, it could also be the unit of data storage. So the very, very simplest pattern that you will likely use at some point is, please allow me to store this bit of information and access it later. And the address of the information is its identity, right? <clears throat> so in a, in a distributed environment, we have the ability to say, here is a grain, and its only reason for existence is the ability to store a bit of information and give it back to us when we need it. The beauty of this is that the, the access to the state will always be serialized. As Sergey pointed out, we have a single threaded model for accessing everything. So you never have a concurrency issue when it comes to, to dealing with that. So you can think about the, the grain state um, pattern as the simplest way to deal with distributed data, right? In, a, in, in, the, in the smallest way possible. So the pattern, um, so by the way, let me, let me take a step back and talk about a little bit about what it is that we're actually talking about in this talk, right? We have a fair bit of experience um, in building real world applications. And we've used Orleans to build real world applications and there are quite a few common patterns that we come across. So for example, in a traditional way, we would deal with a three-tier model. We would talk about uh, you know, entity relationships for the databases, and then you have a domain model for defining your middle tier and so on and so forth. These patterns are equivalent in terms of how we build the applications. So all the code that I'm showing you is freely available. We'll, we'll, we'll point you to the GitHub repo take the patterns and use them as is. <clears throat> I'll spend some time explaining some of the complex patterns, how they're actually implemented, but you actually don't need to even know about those. You just have to use them. So in the case of the object store, um, let me get the shadow of the thing. In the case of the object store, we start by basically defining um, the entity that we want to store. And this is, a, if you did domain-driven design, this would be a domain entity, right? And all we have to do is make it serializable. <coughs> As part of the pattern, what we have is an interface. Uh, is that the thing? Mm -hmm. A laser? Oh, yeah. that's not the laser. <coughs> that's the laser. Beautiful. So this interface is actually part of the pattern library. You won't actually see it anymore. But I put it up here to show you what it looks like. And like I said, it has only one raison d'etre in life it should store some T item and give it back to you when you want it, right? So we write this bit and we write the underlying grain implementation for you. So in order for you to use it, the simplest pattern you can possibly think of, create an item grain that just extends from that, define your grain implementation as a base class implementation, and provide a storage provider which tells the, the, the runtime where you want this grain persisted. And that's it. It's actually the simplest bit of code you'll write. And here's an example of how it actually works. Is the font too small? Um, is it too small? Uh-oh. Um, OK, it's on GitHub. <laughs> <laughs> Fundamentally, I'll, I'll just walk you through it. You, know, you create the grain state. This is an instance of the piece of data we want to store. Get a reference to the grain, as we saw earlier. And then store the reference store the data in, the, in that grain by calling set item. And that's you creating the item, and you reading the item is exactly get item on this. So this is the simplest piece of, of uh, programming that you would use to simply store and retrieve data, right? Not all the patterns are gonna be this simple. So the next pattern is an interesting one. So if you think of that as the, uh, the row of your database, table, this would be the table. Here we have a registry, which is just a grain that keeps references to other grains. And you don't actually 
um, the, the grain does not intervene in the conversation with the, with the, with the, with the things that are stored. All it does is keep a, re, a, a, a group of grains, related grains together. This is a fundamental pattern. Again, we'll see this being used all over the place. And the state management of this registry grain is taken care of in the pattern. So you don't have to write the management of the list of, of grains and so on and so forth. So again, the usage fairly trivial. Um, this time, we we say, hey, we would like to store or we would like to register a bunch of I catalog items into your registry. And again, very complex implementation. It simply derives from the registry grain, right? Underneath the covers, the registry grain knows how to take care of doing stuff. So the way we use it, again, sorry for the small font, but it's on GitHub. Uh, we do the, much the same thing. We create a catalog item, set the item, and then once you get the item set in the grain, you register it into the registry, right? And then when we need to use the catalog, then we can uh, just pick things off from there and pull them out. Now, let's take a look at this code from the point of view of how we're going to use it. So, you know, let's say you're building the next Amazon, right? And you've got a bunch of things that you want to keep track of that you need to sell. Each item is virtually independent of each other item, every other item. So a good thing to do then is to model each of the items that you're going to store in your catalog as an individual grain. And then every time you want to, say, group a bunch of grains together, so say I'm storing, I'm, I'm planning to do clothing, right? So every kind of shirt that I sell or every kind of pants that I sell is its own grain. But then I can have a registry that says, um, this is a list of all the things that pertain to shirts. And this is another registry of all the pants. And then I can have multiple registries that talk about the various sizes. So give me everything that you know fits in this extra large size or whatever it is. So you can have multiple registries having references to the same grain. And you can have the same grain register in multiple registries. So that kind of a matrix model vastly simplifies. And, the, and because the, the registry actually doesn't participate in the conversation of the grain, all it does is hold a reference to it. It doesn't add any performance uh, implication to you receiving information from it. And there's no consistency problem either because all that this thing is doing is keeping track of the reference, it has nothing to do with the material inside the grain itself. So as you can tell, right, this is already starting to be a fairly powerful sort of introduction to how you use storage patterns within Orleans. Now, of course, um, you know, we don't just read things, right? We want to write stuff in there. And then we land up having to persist the things. The traditional approach to doing this is to have, you know, a caching pattern where you have front ends talking all the way down to a source of truth that would tra traditionally be a database. But for performance reasons, you have multiple levels of caching in between. And then you have the interesting problem of trying to figure out uh, when should I invalidate my cache and how do I make sure that the right information is in the right place with the right freshness guarantee, right? So Orleans has an extremely elegant solution to this problem, and Sergey's going to talk about that. Yeah, and so it, the Orleans model of this virtual actors, it essentially creates the cache pattern by itself. So the, this virtual cycle of uh, grain getting from storage to memory and back, that essentially gives you a cache. So you, you can encapsulate individual uh, pieces of state, uh, like uh, catalog items. Uh, in John's example, the individual grains, and whenever they're used, they will be lifted to memory, and then all the read access will, will be from memory. But then the writes, instead of going directly to storage and then causing this cache and validation problem, can go through the exact same item, and all the concurrency issues of concurrent updates uh, those issues uh, disappear because all the writes will be routed through the same piece of code that executes in single-threaded manner uh, and, and talk to storage uh, alone. Uh, 
So in the simplest case, you have read-only. Uh, so you have many, many reads uh, that you need to serve like a web page. But by going to storage only once and lift the storage uh, that stayed in memory, you're only solving a lot of problem of uh, latency and throughput and reduce load in the database without introducing a, a caching tier like memcached or Redis or what have you. So re read through is uh, when you write through that grain into the state. So presumably you have mostly uh, reads but some writes. In this case, you get all the benefits of read only and you only pay for writes when you need to. Interestingly enough, if you think that this is trivial, but this, um, this fact that you remove a concurrency on write access is actually very powerful when you use uh, key value stores uh, with ETAC protection uh, and things like that. We had uh, an example where one of the Skype services it got great benefits on performance and cost, reducing the cost because they eliminated all the write uh, conflicts. Uh, they, they've been processing telemetry and aggregating the story into an um, Azure table, and because they were coming to different front ends and being processed, uh, and try, you try to update a row in the table and, and get um, ETAC violation because some other code already updated. So you need to reread, reply, and retry, and then the other guy is trying to apply uh, the same thing. Uh, their lens based cache, essentially, eliminated this problem altogether, so they got to zero or write conflicts effectively uh, in case there is no failure. And then if you want, you can also do write behind. If, if you can afford to infrequently lose some of the writes in case of um, hardware failure or network or, or availability issues, like you can write, say, every minute or every n number of updates or some combination thereof by just using a timer and say, yeah, accumulate um, writes and then write them periodically. So by, by again, reducing a uh, load um, uh, the storage system. If we put it into uh, the, uh, the catalog, um, uh, terminology. I hope this font is a little bit larger. Can you read it? No? Yes? No? <laughs> so you see we can define uh, two different interfaces, one for read access and, and one for write access. And we can define semantic operations. Like we don't have to necessarily load everything. We can say give me just uh, details or, or all of the information or, or key data. So we can program in this kind of object-oriented way where we have this object and it has methods and it can do semantic operations and then compare it to talking to a key value store, we say give me value of this key, like you, you have to translate it yourself. Here everything uh, behaves like an object and if you see uh, here in, in read example, you just have a couple lines to call to get data and a couple lines to write data and you don't have to worry whether the data is loaded to cache or not or whether it's at storage, it's all automatic. <laughs> and when you implement this code, it's equally simple, so you just need to uh, put this data in, in, in either, either return the state or uh, put it and then write to storage and it's very trivial code, I would argue. So even though we refer to this pattern as smart cache, uh, it's just uh, the case where we couldn't come up with a better name. You could call it like active objects or distributed objects, but those terms were tainted essentially or abused uh, over decades, so we didn't want to call them that. But effectively you have this active entities that have uh, their incarnation cycles where they get activated on servers on, in their cluster and they live there for when they need it and, and disappear, they're always addressable. You don't have to um, take care of loading them into memory or removing uh, them from memory. And that's actually the most popular pattern. And that's sort of a foundation for a lot of the services that people build on top. So that's why I would suggest, even though we call it smart cache, it's much bigger than that in, in reality. Um, in this case, we persisting data, persistent state as is, but as John would argue, <laughs> that's not necessarily the best solution to always uh, save updates. And he's going to talk about the event sourcing option. Yeah. So this is a, probably a good time to tell Sam that DCOM is not a good name for this pattern. Right? So we, we, we resisted the, the idea of doing that. But um, anyway, so uh, we've... We've had a whole bunch of problems that we've figured out over time in terms of scale with updating state. And as a functional programmer, every time I see a shared mutable state, I have a problem. Now, clearly, you know, Orleans has gone a great, uh, to great lengths to make sure that the state writing and mutation happens in a serial fashion. So I get the guarantee that only one thing can actually change the state at any given time. And with the smart cache pattern, I can actually pull stuff back. But 
I still have a problem with that because I lost context. Why did the state change? You, you've, tri you've tracked the fact that the state has changed, but I actually don't know why. And, I, and it turns out that in, in the business, in the business world, a great deal of secondary information can be derived from analyzing the event streams that caused the ch state to change over time. Um, which is why when you put something into an Amazon shopping cart and take it out, they can actually predict, hey, it's the 14th of the month, you're probably blowing budget, you really want this thing, you're likely to buy it in the next two weeks. They can actually derive that information, whereas if you hadn't had the event stream in place, what would have happened is all that would have showed up in the database was the updated um, you know, um, sh uh, shopping cart. So to prevent <clears throat> that kind of thing from happening, we have an event sourcing mechanism. Now, at this point, things are going to get a little hand wavy. And the reason they're going to get a little hand wavy is because we are going to augment not just the Orleans pattern, but progressively going forward, we're going to update the type system that C Sharp uses and eventually extend the language itself to be able to, to support more complex patterns, right? So the talk's going to get a little bit uh, complex at this point. Here's, so think about what it means to store an event that uh, is going to change state. Well, the event has got to be a type of some kind, and there may be a bunch of um, specializations of that type based on the business event. So for example, um, let's think of a bank account, and you can credit money and you can debit money. Both of those are events, and we have to somehow formalize the relationship between the event, the thing that is changing based on the application of the event, and to make sure that we don't have random things being passed off as events, you have to somehow contain the structure of the event into a type. So think of t-event as an enum for types, except that it's a little bit more like an enum on steroids, not just on values, but on types themselves. So people in the F-sharp community or any other functional programming community will recognize the event as a discriminated union type, which doesn't exist as a fundamental building block in C-sharp. We're going to fix that problem in a bit. In fact, we have fixed the problem in the patterns. You'll find that there's actually a pattern for creating discriminated union types, and we use that for T-event, right? But in the pinch, you can actually use the F-sharp type itself. You can define your T-event type in a library with F-sharp and have a succinct way of, of defining what that looks like. <coughs> now the grain state is another interesting piece here because if you think about event storing, we're storing events, a list of events that affect the grain state. So we have to somehow augment the information about the grain state to say, hey, this particular event changes me in this particular way where are you going to get that information from? So you have to bring that information in as well. So we have to make sure that the grain state's not just any old state anymore. It's a state that has an implementation of a method, and that method is specified in the I can apply event. It's kind of a cute name, simply because you have to stick in front of it. But it's really, I'm capable of consuming an event and changing my own state, right? So. Again, font size, sorry. But really what you're doing here is an example, and I'm just gonna show an example of a credit and a debit. We have a bank account grain that we pulled out, and we're gonna show the account state by just looking at all the events that have actually happened. But then we call credit amount, and it should change the balance. But not just change the balance, but also add on the fact that it recorded that it changed the balance because of a credit. And those the, uh, the, those, the sequence of events over here will actually land up accumulating over time. I'll be happy to show you the code for what the, the, the event actually looks like, but it's really, really, really complex in C sharp. It's four lines in F sharp, but it's got 200 in C, in, in, in the C sharp side. So, um, See, Jan is smiling. <laughs> If you, if you think the font size is small on this one, it'll be much worse if we do this. 
So just take it from me that the concept you have to realize is that now we are really talking about encapsulating intent in a type. That's your event type. And encapsulating the ability to consume instances of that event and, uh, and change your own state. And that's the, the bit that actually uh, implements the I can apply event. Okay, those are the two fundamental pieces that allow us to build this complex pattern. I'm going to go on a little bit and talk about something that everyone asks me. All right, now we've managed to put stuff in into some kind of an object store. We've managed to read it out, so we have the ability to do cataloging type of thing. Using that smart cache pattern and a registry, I can put things on sale. I can say all shirts my size that are pink in color, 20% off. I can do that by basically creating a registry for the shirts that fit my requirement, and then through that, through that registry, go and get all the items and update some state associated with it, right? So if you think about it, the, that's, an, that's a pattern that we can already do. But how do I report on these things? People ask the question about how do I find out an ad hoc query, select star from? And it turns out that's a difficult problem to solve because we've kind of sacrificed uh, that for the ability to talk about the individual units of state and individual access to that state. So because of that, we now, it's still a valid use case. I mean, it's still absolutely essential that we want to be able to say, for example, figure out how much money we've made. That's a very good thing, right? I mean, you have to figure out how much we sold and then how much money we got and then how much of stuff we had to give back in refunds and all of the other stuff. So that's important. So we're not downplaying that. We have a new pattern for it. And this is the first example that you'll find in our pattern story where we take existing patterns and compose them. So if you take a registry pattern now and the event sourcing pattern, we can process the events in more than one place. So the event comes and changes the state of a grain. You can forward that event on to, to a registry that holds a bunch of grains that we're interested in. And now we can aggregate by applying the event to the registered aggregate, if you get my drift, right? So we create a green which ag aggregates events from a set of registered greens, and then we can apply those event processing things with a various set of strategies. So for example, the simplest strategy that we have is the one that is lazy load. You want a total, I'll go and compute it for you, right? I'll compute it for you by asking each of the grains to give me the set of events that I haven't seen already. And I will consume those, apply that onto myself, <coughs> and then I will hand you a total. And that is now valid as of this time. So inherent in this is the concept of eventual consistency because stuff may be happening all the time, but your total will be valid as of a given point in time which if you really think about it, that's all you get in a guarantee from a database anyway. The fact that you can do a select star from something and sum it up only tells you the validity of that sum up until the point when you did the query. <coughs> we get that from here. Again, this code is already there, it's written. Please go and look at it. It's quite complex. The, the purpose of this talk is to walk you through the possibilities of what we can do the actual bit about actually aggregating stuff and playing these events and so on and so forth, the code's there and hopefully it's readable. So you can <laughs> go and take a look at it, right? <clears throat> there are very for, few for loops in it. Those people that attended my talk yesterday will know what I'm talking about. So here's, here's, um, here's what the aggregate pattern looks like. And it says, hey, I'm a registry of T grain. So now I'm going to have references to a bunch of T grains. And each T grain is an event source grain that has a bunch of events that are going to fire it. And my grain state is going to be an aggregate as well because I need to be able to handle the event. So just by looking at the type signature of this interface, you can get a sense, you can reason about what it's actually going to do. And as it turns out, 
we have to introduce this concept of a timestamped value because we actually care about when the events come in so that we only play the events one at a time. And I mean, uh, once, at most once. And we're able to do this. So again, the implementation is fairly straightforward. But this is interesting because I want to just show you what it looks like to build the grain state class to implement I can apply event. And in this case, the apply event effectively does a pattern match on the various operations that come from the, the discriminated union I was talking about. And you only need to provide the bit that says, please add an amount when I want a credit and subtract an amount when I want to do a debit. And in effect, this is all the business logic that you really need to write. And you can even unit test those bits independently. So with the, with the kind of composite patterns that we have now, you can actually build a fairly sophisticated system with minimal amount of clutter from your side. And that's the goal of what we want to use Orleans for, is to be able to say, hey, don't think about it as a distributed C-sharp. Don't think about it as activating a grain on a remote server and all of that. What you really want is, I have a bunch of bank accounts, and I want to keep a total. That's what creating the bank account looks like. And that's what aggregating it looks like. That's really all that we need to worry about. In fact, that's all you have to provide. This you will definitely not be able to read because I couldn't read it. But I'll just walk you through what's happening. You get the ag account aggregate. You get a bunch of grains. There are 10 of them in our system. So you get a whole bunch of grains here. And you register the grain because that's what you do with, the, with this. This is now behaving like a registry. Credit $100 to each of the accounts. And then read the balance from the aggregate grain. And magically in the background, because you're going through the registry, at this point, the aggregate value will go off and in the lazy strategy, go and pull all the information, update itself, and provide you the value. And this value is now eventually consistent. So you can now add this lot, another $100 for each of the accounts, and you'll find that this will actually land up being $2,000. So this is a way of, of aggregating stuff. Now, one of the things that, um, this is simple scalar aggregate. There's nothing that prevents the aggregate from being a vector, so you can actually keep track of other grains. So you can say, you know, you can get a mul multitude of rows. You don't have to aggregate down to a single value. You can aggregate down to a list of things. And therefore, at this point, we have, if you think about it, implemented an object store <coughs> on a distributed platform with minimal code that you need to write to make it work. We have the objects living in a scalable way. We have thread safety guarantees to make sure that you have um, concurrency management. You have the ability to eventually uh, compute aggregates with eventual consistency. You can create materialized views. Those are the standing queries that, that, those, that aggregate class effectively lets you set up. And you can actually build a fairly sophisticated system without deviating too much from the domain model that you would have come up with when you did your domain-driven design to begin with. The single anti-pattern in this whole thing is the ad hoc query. So if you feel the deep desire to have an ad hoc query, the first question you should ask is, why? Because at the end of the day, even in a traditional application, you are not giving a SQL interface to your application's database. You're only using the ad hoc query to make it easy for you to do development. Well, you can do the development here internally. It's a little bit more work. You have to formalize what kind of views you want and so on. But the building pieces for the object store are already here. Now, we have uh, spent about 35 minutes going from a very, very trivial single object store all the way down down to a scalable object uh, database. And I appreciate the fact that the levels of complexity that you've been asked to assimilate are significant. So I'm going to take a pause here and see if there's anyone who has any questions.
because I think we will, we will address these questions while you still have them fresh in your mind. <coughs> Does anyone have any issues that they want to discuss? Yes. That's a brilliant question. The, so the question that was asked was, does the aggregate pattern introduce a bottleneck? Because now you are, are uh, processing updates through the aggregate. The answer is actually, um, it depends on the strategy that you pick. So the, the pattern that we have allows you to update and send events to the greens themselves. That's what the traditional event sourcing model was. We then <coughs> query the grains for the events that we haven't seen yet on demand. So there's no throughput bottleneck when you're writing stuff. We don't broadcast the, the events to the aggregate. At the time when you ask for the total, then we say, hey, let's see how fresh my total is. And starting from then till now, has any of the grains that I've referenced uh, do, do they have any events that I haven't processed? So it's the job of the aggregate to go to the registry grain and say, hey, give me all the account grains, and then for each one of them, what are the events? Right. So there is a strategy pattern that's built in called the lazy loader strategy, which does that for you. Now, you can replace that with a more eager way of doing it. There are actually far more sophisticated approaches that you can take. For example, when Sergey talks about streaming, you can actually publish the changes that come to you and consume them as and when you like. So you can say, for example, have a thread that runs off and every 10 seconds keep your data up to date, right? If that's all you're interested in, that's all you'll need to do. But the decoupling of the computation of the aggregate from the writing of the individual events into the grains that's the fundamental reason why the stuff works. So we actually decouple those and separate them out and make them two separate problems. Updating the state via saving events is one story. Computing the total in some form, either proactively or reactively or lazily or whatever, that's actually a separate concern and we have the ability to just plug whatever strategy you want in there to be able to do that. <coughs> There is also another pattern which we're not covering, a reduced pattern, where the aggregation can be done in layers. So instead of having one aggregator, have like a first layer aggregator, second layer aggregator, and that's very scalable because instead of going to one, you pulling and pushing, you go through uh, several layers of aggregation. Just we're not talking about in yes. this talk, but it's that's there right. on the Arlene's Contrib uh, repo. It's also there. So um, one of the recommendations in event sourcing is actually taking a snapshot every X events so you don't have to replay a million events. Um, is Orleans doing a similar thing? So remember that all this stuff is not actually being done as a foundational piece of Orleans. The, the reason we have this talk is because Orleans is extraordinarily scalable and extraordinarily powerful and people have built all kinds of cool applications on top of it. But when you want to write applications, you'll find that you'll have to replicate the same similar patterns. So what we are talking about is actually a level above the fundamental set of Orleans, right? So in terms of the question that you raised, that's a separate strategy for creating the materialized view. You can have the materialized view update itself every 10 minutes. And if 10 minute resolution is all you need, well, you don't even have to go and ask at that point. You just take whatever aggregate value you have and pass that along and knowing full well that in 10 minutes someone else will come and process all the events that have happened since then. The pattern that we've shown you is an example pattern of how to create a lazily loaded aggregate. The fundamental interface that we have here will not change depending on which pattern, which, which uh, strategy you use to get the aggregate grain. This specific aggregate grain turns out to be a lazily um, evaluated total. But you can most certainly have a variety of strategies to keep the materialized views up to date. Any other questions? 
Sorry, are the um, events actually sort of persisted with the grain historically? Can you go back and replay them? That's an excellent question. So this is one of the reasons why we use composite patterns. So if you look at the aggregate grain, there are composite patterns in this. So we have a system now where the grain state of the grain itself is going to be able to process its events. So what did we do when we wrote the event sourcing pattern? We actually said, hey, the grain state that you want, you want to store information about a shirt, fine, I'll do that. But I'll also store all the things that happened to that event. So in the case of the example, we had a bank balance. We had all the credits and debits. And the augmented grain that we've generated for you, when you say this is an aggregate grain, takes care of storing the events and persisting it. So you don't have to worry about any of that. So as far as you are concerned, you send an event by making a method call. Please credit me $100 or whatever it is. Internally, what that translates to is I'll instantiate an instance of the event called credit with the argument of 100, timestamp it with now, store it in the sequence, and when the aggregate comes and says, please give me all the events I haven't seen, I know which ones to pull out and give back. So the storage of the events and all of that, all of that stuff is abstracted away for you and implemented in the pattern. So you can use the pattern as is, so you can extend it to how to be whatever you want. But this is one of those powerful patterns that you can use. It's a time check. I think we have 15 minutes we have left. To, okay, we should probably, can we hold your question till the end? Yes. Excellent, thank you. Um, actually, at this point, it's a good time to actually stop and switch gears entirely. So I'm going to ask Sergey to talk about so, so far, we, we talk a lot about the managing state and, and create this object store. But what we didn't talk about is the relations in, in this data. So we kind of have this top-down view. You have individual items. You, uh, you go and, and call them. But in reality, in, in many scenarios, you have relations. Uh, like th in this picture, it's a multiplayer game. Like in a graph where it shows players that have short-lived relations for game sessions, but longer-lived relations uh, as part of a clan or a group of friends, whatever. Um, in this release model, it's very easy to, to very initial to model because this reference to a grain that you get from the system, it's actually just identity. So you can easily save it as part of your state and, and establish this edge of your relation with, with another grain. And because that uh, other grain doesn't need to be in memory when you have relations with it, that makes it very easy to program. This is where the virtual actor model works much better than the traditional approach to, to actor model with the Coraline or Echo, where you have to have a physical reference to all these objects. So in order to have a graph of relations, they all have to be in memory and, and have physical um, references or URIs or, or what have you there. And this actually is, is a very popular uh, thing that's used in, in, in production in many services where in, in the gaming domain, but if I switch to this slide, nothing's changed except for I, I change uh, words I put in, in, in those um, in those boxes, now we have devices, IoT devices, so sensors and, and the controllers, uh, and, and rooms where they belong. It's the same kind of problem, but now it's, it's a much uh, more static graph than, than the game graph where relations change. Uh, that, that's why like, when we talk about social networks, people immediately jump into uh, Facebook, Twitter, but in reality, this network of relations and graph, it's a much more general problem, and it's very easy um, to solve here. But, but also, if you look at it, you kind of get back this object-oriented feeling of your program, which we sort of gave up early on, say, oh, you have everything has to be uh, service-oriented, or SOA and all kinds of variations, microservices, they all kind of push you to think of, of your program from the services perspective. But as developers, uh, the natural way to model things is through objects and their relations. And this distributed network of objects or distributed network of entities sort of gives you that power back and that sanity of dealing with objects and, and relations, like a graph of um, nodes and edges between them. Uh, and, and because of the virtual actor, um, virtual actor um, nature of Orleans, you can program uh, as if all of your actors are in memory. So you have this kind of infinite virtual naming space or address space that you can program without worrying about do you have enough memory or do you need to load something or unload. So you get automatic um, resource management. 
And of course, there are anti-patterns. So if you have too small of a grain, you have too much connectivity, so you need to send too many messages. If you have too coarse of a grain, they become bottlenecks because you're trying to process all the stuff there on the single, uh, within the single thread uh, guaranteed concern. So chatty communication in the distributed system is always uh, the pain. Another thing uh, sort of orthogonal to that is uh, the early streaming feature, uh, which we added two or three years ago, I think. Um, what we showed so far was RPC style communication between actors or client and actor where you get the reference and they make a call and get a task back, which covers a lot of scenarios, but in, in some cases you want to decouple producer and consumer, or you want to make these uh, messages, uh, these events to be reliable, because RPC may fail if you don't have a network uh, connection, if uh, something happened, uh, if machine went down. With streaming uh, that can go over persistent queues, you solve this problem because the moment I publish and get a confirmation that my event gets written to a persistent queue, I'm done. It's, it's the problem of um, the receiver or subscriber to, to process it later. So this is a, a very um, powerful feature that enables a lot of scenarios like that. Like in, in the IoT case, devices may ingest data into the queues and not worry about them being processed. They kind of done their job as they uh, enqueue the events. Um, and, and the key thing here is that there's no notion of logical streams, so we call them virtual streams. You have virtual actors and virtual streams. So they, they all, uh, you can have, again, infinite amount of them because it's just identity. But physically, they get multiplexed over physical queues, whether you use uh, AWS SQS or Kafka or Event Hub, um, Azure queues. They, they kind of under the covers get uh, multiplexed over those physical pipes. Uh, and, and here's an example uh, of, say, streaming analytics kind of case where I have a grain that is explicitly told to subscribe. So it has this, let me try to use this fancy laser pointer. Yeah, I'm fancy. All right. uh, so it's explicitly told to subscribe to a stream and pass the source stream and, and identity of the source stream as a GUID and uh, identity of the alert stream. So the, the idea is I keep receiving events and process them, and if there is uh, some condition is met, like I exceeded threshold or I have five uh, bad events in, 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 in within the span of a minute, I need to raise an alert. So to set it up, uh, when I call subscribe, I get the stream provider, in this case, uh, just the name of event hub provider, and I get a stream for source stream. So I pass the ID and the namespace device events, and I subscribe this class that implements um, iAsync observer of device events. So that's all I need to subscribe explicitly to a stream of events. But I also get a stream for alerts, so I use the alert stream ID and a different namespace of streams. This is the stream where I'm gonna produce my alerts to. So when, when the event arrives, this on the next async method is called, it's kind of a Rexish API, I process this event uh, and I get an alert, and if alert is set, I just do on next async on the alert stream. That's my output. And that's kind of all I need to do to receive events, process them, and I can run many of them uh, in, in parallel. So you can have this one per uh, machine I'm monitoring, one per device I'm monitoring. So it's very easy with this um, addressing scheme. But then if you look uh, on the alert side, we use a different feature here. I apply this implicit stream subscription attribute, which allows me not to subscribe explicitly to a stream. So this, uh, this grain class, alert processor grain, it's already subscribed to streams within this namespace, device alerts. Remember, we use it here to produce device alerts. So I'm associating this grain class with the namespace of streams, and then these GUIDs would map to a GUIDs of grains, and my grain will get activated right away. So in my unactivated sync, which is kind of like a constructor of a grain, I, I set up a, a subscription just because I cannot persist lambdas. And then when the event arrives, I can again process it. And if condition is met, I can do whatever I want. I can make a call to a web service, I can write it to a database, I can make a call to another grain. So it's a kind of freeform model. So why we build it? So we needed um, this ability to process large uh, streams of events, a large number of streams of events um, with low latency and, and high throughput. Uh, and it came from sort of a, another set of Halo uh, game scenarios where the stream and uh, the events during the game keep coming in from consoles in, into the cloud. They need to be processed at the end of the game. You need to show all the statistics, all the results, like headshots and kill death ratio, all of that, the promotions. So you need to calculate it 
by the time the game is done. So these calculations happen as events arrive and get processed in the grains, and, and at the end, um, they just get queried uh, and returned. And there are many, others, many other applications, like uh, cheat detection is no different from credit card fraud detection, because you see the patterns you follow. You monitor a particular credit card number. You don't need to monitor all of them. You can do this grain per credit card number and see if the events coming in and analyze uh, their relations and then raise um, <coughs> alerts if you see things like that. But you can also uh, apply streams for uh, the aggregation where instead of sending data directly according, you can just publish it on the aggregation stream and, and process them uh, separately and decouple um, your event sourcing part from, from aggregation part. So this covers kind of, or touches at least, a lot of the state and uh, some of the relations, but we haven't talked much about compute. This yeah. is where John will continue. Yeah. So state machines, they're actually everywhere. Um, most of the code that we write, they're actually concurrent state machines that need to be run in a scalable way. I mean, think about um, shopping cart. Let's go back to the e-commerce thing. Um, each shopping cart is actually a state machine. It's it's uh, you. Um, if the state, if the, if, the, if the shopping cart is in an empty state, well, checking out shouldn't really be allowed. Um, you can abandon something that has something that's full, and you can uh, check it out if you want. But you, know, you shouldn't check out an empty shopping cart. Now, this business rule, for example, is really something that should be modeled somewhat formally as a state machine, but usually gets modeled informally, and the source of most of our bugs actually comes from the ability to, the inability to reason about these side effects that are encoded implicitly in the code, and that you have to then discover the intent of by walking through the thing to see, how did we even allow this to happen, right? And anyone who's done stuff in the, serv in the service arena knows this is why logs exist. And so you're sitting there, mostly trying to do printf debugging on something that happened you know, in a server that sits in Sweden, um, which you have no access to, and you're trying to reconstruct you know, what killed the patient. Right? We don't want to do that. It'd be much easier if we had a formal way of actually managing state within a context that allowed you to formally talk about it. Right? And so one of the approaches for this is typically, I mean, is to use stateless microservices and then manage the data in the implicit form to, to achieve this ability. Or you could use the actor as, in effect, a stateful microservice that had the logic built in. Nanoservice. Hmm? Nanoservice. Nano, minus nano service, pico service, whatever, right? And so, like I said, um, we have now taken this pattern and come up with an example of what that would look like. And again, I'm not going to show you the code itself. It's really horrendous in, in C sharp because of the lack of discriminatory unions. We will see why that is in a minute. But further, We've actually formalized the business logic of, say, a bank account. There's a toy bank account over here. Um, so let's say that you have a bank account. It's identified by an ID. You're interested in its balance. Um, it can be either you know, accept a, a deposit or a withdrawal, or you can close it. Um, initially, when you bring up a bank account, please don't put money into it. It's a zero balance account. right? And if it's in zero balance, then you put some money in via deposit it becomes an active bank account. Or you can close the zero balance account and go to closed. When it's active, you can deposit some more and it'll stay active. If you withdraw, depending on how much you withdrew, it'll either be an active or an overdrawn or a zero balance. Right? And if you're overdrawn, please don't let them take any more money out of the thing. The deadbeats have already taken the money out of the account. Right? You don't want them to take some more. And depending on how much they deposit, then they either get sent back into grace, or they stay overdrawn, or we can finally get to the point where there's zero balance. And notice now that you can't close anything other than a zero balance account. Now, by embedding this kind of logic into the, the formal description of the business, 
you've eliminated entire swathes of problems. You know, this is a whole bunch of unit tests you never had to write, right? So of course, um, you know, people know me as the F sharp dude. So I, uh, or as an F sharp dude. So my problem, everything here is a type problem, as far as I'm concerned. If you look at this, that's a discriminated union. A message can be only one of those three things. That's a type. The set of states is also a discriminated union, can only be in one of those four states. That's also a type. Each message that is acceptable at a given state, that's also a type. Each return value that is possible when I receive a message, that's also a type. So now you've got a whole slew of discriminated union types, each of which are four or 500 lines of C-sharp code. So the font's really, really going to be small when I show you what the code looks like. Right? But you can actually generate most of it. So there will be another talk at some point in the future, shortly, where we have gone ahead and built a tool that parses this language and generates the Orleans grain for you. But in the meanwhile, you can actually go and see what that looks like and see why there is a need for a generator. Because really what you want to do is, what do I want to write when I want to create the bank account? I want to write, what does it mean to do this? When I deposit something, what does it mean? When I withdraw something, how do I know which of these three values is returned? That's really the entire business logic of the application that I want to write. I don't want to worry about scale. I don't want to worry about where this object lives. I don't want to worry about grains, grain states, none of this. I'm only interested in writing six functions in this entire thing. And I want to have the guarantee that I couldn't make a mistake. And with that motivation in mind, you know, we can actually build an Orleans Green backend that supports this behavior in a scalable way, allows you to run 10,000 of these accounts in parallel if you like, manage each individual account state independently and concurrently, <laughs> and allow you to interact with it in a sensible way. So rather than show you how it's done, I'll show you how we use it because we're really, really short on time at the moment. So here's how I create a bank account state machine. And if I get this balance at this point, I would expect that it's zero. And then I create a deposit of $100. I expect it to be zero. But now my state better be active, which means that I should be able to withdraw $20 from it and my state better be active. And if I try to close an active state machine, what do I expect? An exception. I expect not to be able to close that. So if I ran this code, I would actually get an invalid message returned as an exception, saying I tried to close an account which wasn't in zero balance state, and I failed as I expected it. And this whole thing comes with IntelliSense because of the type system. That's really the state that we're trying to aim towards, right? Make developers productive and give them the ability to write scalable applications. So I'm gonna wrap it up with just giving you an overview of the cross-cutting benefits of Orleans. Now we've talked about all of this stuff. You can build very complex things with it. You can build things that require tools to generate the Orleans grain for you. That's the story that I'd like to leave you with. We have one of those examples in place. So the goal behind it is to let the system manage the life cycle of the actors, manage your access in a type safe way, give you a natural idiomatic C-sharp way of talking to these things, give you the capacity to deal with um, uh, exceptions and type safety, and then have linear scalability when it comes to actually throwing more hardware on the system. You, so that's actually the cross-cutting benefits of using Orleans. And using patterns that sit on top of Orleans, you can build very complex things. And we have these libraries that allow you to do that. So the, uh, Orleans is open source. There's a very active community that's out there. There's contributions accepted from the Orleans community. In fact, all the code in the patterns that we talked about will eventually show up over there. In the meanwhile, um, you can come to my grubby little grit repo and take a look at that. 
Um, and then there's a Gitter site that allows you to go and have a conversation uh, with anyone who's um, in the Orleans community saying, would you please help me with this? Um, and then that's, that's where we are at the moment. I think we're two minutes over time. Thank you. Don't forget to leave green feedback. <laughs> uh, I will take questions, actually, at the end of it. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to let Sergey take it. It's a question. Is about at, at least once delivery of messages. So it, it's 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 a very kind of deep question about delivery guarantees. <laughs> so the the default delivery guarantee uh, in Orleans is at most once. So we can configure it to have retries, and if you configure it to high enough number, you can get uh, at least once. In practice, what we've seen that's a not a great idea to do, because usually you're losing messages when they're failures, like failures of machines, failures of network. And in that case, if you keep retrying, keep resending all the events, you're not making things better, you're making things worse. So the, that's why default is we deliver, or try to deliver the message, and in most cases, it will get delivered. In some small percentage of cases, when there are failures, you'll get an exception back. And usually the application code knows, has an idea, do you want it to try or not? So it, we thought it, it needs to be an explicit decision at the application layer instead of blindly trying to resend all, all, um, all messages which application may not want to send and then make recovery from, say, network partition even harder. Um, the question is about uh, when you send a message to an actor that is down. So the, technically, the actor cannot be down. The machine can be down. Uh, and, and because all the methods that you have uh, in, in, in gray interfaces return a task, you always have this clear, either you succeed it or you get an exception back. So if we send a message and the machine is down, it just died a millisecond ago. We haven't discovered that it's dead. We just failed to deliver the message. We'll get an exception, exception back. We failed to deliver this message which in distributed systems is always ambiguous because maybe the message actually went through and connection died later and we didn't get an act. So you always have this ambiguity with distributed systems. But with, um, with task-based uh, async RPC, you have this very easy uh, correlation ID under the covers. <laughs> where instead of sending one-way messages and receiving one-way responses and correlating what went through or not, you get this uh, task back that tells you there was an exception if you need to retry or, or not. The queuing, uh, yes. Through you can use Orlean streaming for this if you like. You can basically put it onto your queue, subscribe some, uh, publish some event, and then let the, the let the the recipient pick the events off at their will. So the queue centric workflow is typically the answer to the question that you just raised. The way you implement queue centric workflow is to go through streaming. Um, so from that point of view, you you couple queue centric workflows and virtual, with <clears throat> virtual actors, which basically have no beginning or end. They just exist when you need them, or they're active when you need them. And those, that combination actually gives us the ability to build systems with a, with a higher level of guarantee. So queues essentially give you at least once. <clears throat> they, they still have this uh, kind of dead letter kind of handling where it would keep trying to deliver and keep consistently getting error back, and there is a mechanism to indicate well, we're dropping because we consistently failing to deliver, but other than that, it, it's at least once with streams. Any other questions? Oh, well, we made everything 100% clear. Right. Cool. <laughs> okay. Thank you.